Hi, I'm Brandon from Achievable. Before we get started, just a quick plug for our learning program. Achievable offers courses on all major FINRA and NASAA exams, including the SIE, Series 6, 7, 63, 65, and 66 exams. This is a great learning program if you're looking for easy to understand, fun, and engaging material that uses technology to help you pass. I wrote the course content exclusively for Achievable, which includes tons of real world examples, videos just like this one on dozens of key topics, a built-in study planner, hundreds of chapter review questions, and unlimited practice exams. In short, if you love these videos, then you will love what we have on Achievable. Our courses are competitively priced, and you can try them out for free to see if our style is the right fit for you. Follow the links below in the description to get started. Let's take a look at an income strategy question together, pick it apart, see if we can uh, look at the inner workings of what's going on so we can understand overall how to approach these strategies and how to consistently get test questions on them correct. All right. In January, an investor buys 100 shares of PDQ stock when the market price is 60. After a few months, the stock price goes to 70. The investor believes the market will not rise above 75 by the end of October. To take advantage, they go short one PDQ October 75 call, collecting a $400 total premium. Okay, there's a lot given in this question. It's kind of a story that they've uh, presented us with here. If you happen to get one of these longer questions on the exam, just hang in there, take your time, breathe. It's going to be okay. In reality, there's, there's only a couple things that happen here that are important, although there's a lot more language uh, that's added that might make it seem like there's a ton more going on. Essentially, we have an investor that bought shares of PDQ stock at 60, and then later, after the market price rises, they sell or go short a October 75 call. This is an income strategy, specifically a covered call. Remember, a short call has unlimited risk potential as a standalone single leg strategy. If that 75 call is all by itself and the market price rises significantly, let's say up to 1,000, the investor has an obligation to sell stock at 75. They'd have to go to the market, buy stock at 1,000, sell the stock at 75 through the option being exercised, and lose a ton of money if that were to occur. But the call is covered by virtue of the investor owning the shares of stock already. They don't have to go to the market to buy shares to, to be able to deliver them at 75 or sell them at 75. Now, as the name suggests, this is an income strategy. An investor is looking to create additional income specifically by selling the call. The call is not the primary focus for the investor. The stock is. The stock is really their money maker. But an investor would entertain the idea of an income strategy if they were to think the market price were to stay flat over the next short term period, in this case here until the end of October. Investor buys stock at 60, market price rises to 70, probably feeling pretty good about themselves. But hey, maybe in the next few months, they just don't think the stock price is going to go above 75. So by selling a 75 call, they've essentially put a ceiling above themselves at 75. Remember, call up, put down. Call up. If the market price rises above 75, that call is going to be exercised, forcing the investor to sell their stock at 75. Remember what a short call is, the obligation to sell. Now going to the second question, what is the market sentiment? Which just means what, what is the investor hoping happens here? And this is a tough question to answer with any multi-part option strategy. Now why? Well, we're long stock, which is bullish, right? Want the market price to rise. Or shorter call, which is bearish, want the market price to fall. The best way to think about an income strategy is to prioritize and focus on the stock position. The stock is really what the investor cares most about. And of course, an investor that's long stock wants the market to rise. They're bullish. But the problem is we've got a call that tells us, hey, if the market price goes above 75, we're going to get exercised and we're just going to have to sell our stock at 75. So if we put the big picture together, this is really a bull neutral strategy. I'd probably say mostly neutral. The investor here is selling the call for two reasons. Number one, they're making a premium off of the option and it's money in their pocket. Number two, 
they don't think the market price is going to rise significantly. If they thought there was a chance that the market price would rise significantly to 100, 150, or there's just a lot of upside potential in the short term, selling the call would be a bad move. Because again, yeah, the, the call is going to give you some money from selling the, the option. It's going to give you that premium. But if the market price were to rise, say, to 150, the investor would have made a lot more money if they hadn't sold the call. And that's why we'll call this a bull neutral strategy. Once we go through some of the numbers below, I think the big picture will start coming together. Let's take a look at our handy dandy T chart, which is not an absolute necessity to answer these questions correctly, but a lot of people like T charts, especially visual based learners. Uh, and I, I like T charts myself because they help me keep the numbers straight. And therefore I don't have a bunch of numbers swirling around my head that I might forget or not keep track of. This is how my T chart always looks. I have a plus and minus column on the left and right side. Plus would be for money in, minus would be for money out. And then I have an option in a stock row. Let's go ahead and fill out our T chart for what we have just based upon what's in the question. Now the investor buys 100 shares of PDQ stock at 60. And with that information, I'm gonna plug a 60 on the minus column in the stock row. I personally like using the small numbers, meaning $60 per share instead of putting 6,000 there. Could you put 6,000? Absolutely. Go with whatever way looks best to you. The only thing you have to remember though is if you use small numbers like me, you just gotta remember to multiply it times, in this case, 100 at the bottom or multiply it by however many shares are involved. If it was 300 shares and three calls that were sold in this question, we need to multiply times 300 at the bottom. Just gotta remember that one part. So again, we have a 60 in the minus column in the stock row, because we bought stock at 60, that's money out of our pocket. We will also plug in a four on the plus column in the option row. And that's because we sold that option for a total $400 premium on a per share basis, that would be four. Now, some of you might be asking, wait, what about the 75? The 75 is the strike price, which may or may not come into play. If the option is exercised, of course, we'll plug 75 into the T chart. If it goes unexercised, then it won't go in there. The only thing that we can say affirmatively is that we sold an option and collected a $4 per share premium. And that's how our T chart will look and start with every single math question that we come across. A 60 on the minus column, a four on the plus column. Great. Now let's go to maximum gain. The best way to think through any of the potentials, being maximum potential gain, maximum potential loss, even break even. The best way to think about this is to use the stock as our starting point. And the stock will really define where we want the market to go and where we don't want the market to go. So if we think about it, okay, I'm um, long stock. Long stock is a bullish strategy, which means we'll make money if the market price were to rise. Can the market rise infinitely? Is there any ceiling to the market? No. Market can go up, 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 up. So if we think about that, sometimes it's easy to pick a number. Just go with an absurd number. Say the market price rises to 1,000. That would be great for the stock position, but we have to make sure that we're keeping in mind what would happen to the option in that scenario. At 1,000, the call is deep in the money. Call up, remember? Calls get exercised if the market price rises up above the strike price. And at 1,000, or technically any price above 75, that call is in the money, it has intrinsic value, which just means, in, in a nutshell, it's gonna get exercised. Most of the time when you're short an option, you don't want that option to be exercised. And in this case, if the market price were to rise to 1,000, we would really hope that we didn't get exercised, but the, the reality is exercise is going to happen. That call will be exercised by the person that bought it, forcing the investor to sell stock at 75. And we'll plug that in. We'll put a 75 on the plus column in the stock row. And from that point, we just need to add up all the numbers. That's the end of the story. We have a four and a 75 on the plus side, together that's 79. We have a 60 on the minus side. We net those out together. That leaves us with 19 on the plus side, multiply times 100, it's a $1,900 maximum gain. And that's why this is a bull neutral strategy. If the market price were to rise and the call gets exercised, hey, the investor 
is still making money. They're in fact they're going to make their maximum potential gain, whether the market price goes to seventy five or a thousand or anywhere above seventy five. They're at their maximum potential gain. Now, if the market price were to stay relatively flat, or let's say the market price were to go up to seventy five and just stop, investor would make money on the stock position plus the premium together. Hopefully that helps paint the picture as to why this is a bull neutral strategy. Let's go ahead and reset the T-chart. We still have a 60 on the minus side and a four on the plus side. Now maximum loss, we will think about through the same lens as we did with maximum gain. Remember the stock is the primary focus of this strategy. Hey, if I'm long stock, where's my maximum loss? It'd be when the market price falls. And we don't have to think, you know, we don't just have to pick a number out of thin air here. Zero is worst case scenario for our stock position. If the market price were to fall all the way down to zero, we would lose all the value of our stock, which wouldn't be good. Now, the only other thing we have to ask ourselves is what happens to the option in that scenario? Okay, market price falls all the way down to zero. You have to think call up, put down, call up. Did the market price go up above the strike price? No. At zero, or really any price below 75, the option is out the money, has no intrinsic value, which just means it's not gonna be exercised. It will expire worthless. Now there's a small good from that and a big bad from that. The small good is we keep the premium, that's easy money, right? Don't have to do anything. Now the big bad part of it is the stock just lost a bunch of money and the option's not helping us here. There's one last step to our T-chart. It would really just be kind of putting in a useless number. If we were to sell the stock at zero, I would put a zero on the plus side if we just want to complete the T-chart. And that would be the end of the story. Sell the stock for nothing. So we end up with a four on the plus side, a 60 on the minus side. That leaves us with 56 left over on the minus side times 100. That is a $5,600 maximum loss. Of course, this is not a hedging strategy. The, the option is not there to protect the investor. But I do want to point something out. Some people call this type of strategy a partial hedge. Now, why would we call it a partial hedge? Well, let's think about it. If we bought stock at 60 and the market price were to go all the way down to zero, that, that's a $6,000 loss there. But by selling the call, that put 400 extra dollars in the investor's pocket, which reduced their risk level overall. So could it be argued the call acts as a partial hedge? Yeah. And sometimes investors will even look at this as a way to justify that a cover call is actually a really safe strategy. If I were to compare the stock position to the stock position with a short call, the short call added into the mix reduces overall risk for the investor, which is why if we have an investor that already owns stock, recommending they sell a call against that stock is really not introducing much risk at all. In fact, it's the opposite it's reducing overall risk. And from a suitability standpoint, you might even see a test question where you recommend a covered call to a more safe or conservative investor. So the stock position is really where the investor is absorbing risk or facing risk. The short call is not introducing risk. In fact, again, last time I'll say it, it's reducing risk overall for the investor and putting money in their pocket. All that in exchange for putting a ceiling above themselves of 75. Let's go ahead and wipe the T-chart clean. We still have a four on the plus side, a 60 on the minus side, and we get to break even. Break even is always my biggest selling point to using a T-chart. Now, this will work for any hedging or income strategy that you come across. If you can get to the point where you feel comfortable enough with just filling out the T-chart for what happened in the question, in this case here, we have a four on the plus side, a 60 on the minus side. There's only one question we have to ask ourselves to answer break even. And that is what number could we introduce that would give us a balanced out T-chart? In particular, where would the stock price need to go to give us the same number on both sides? And there's only one answer to that. If 56 is plugged into the stock row on the plus side, we end up with 60 on both sides. And that is our break even. T-charts are great for break-even questions because there's only one number we could plug in that would get us a balanced out T-chart. Now, let's think about this a little bit more conceptually. The investor sold an option for a total of a $400 premium. And if they were to buy stock at 60 and then just sell this call, hey, if the market price were just to stay flat at 60, they're still gonna collect that $400 total premium 
they're still going to be profiting at that point. So maybe one way to think about this is if I sell an option against the stock position, I will break even only if the market price falls by the amount of the premium I collected. If I lose $4 per share in the stock position, that will offset the $4 per share I made by selling the option. So for those of you who like formulas, by the way, I'm not a big fan of formulas for options just because there's a million of them, but with a covered call, the price the stock is purchased at minus the option premium on a per share basis will tell you break even every time. Let's go ahead and wipe the T-chart clean. We still have four on the plus side, 60 on the minus side. Now for the last two questions, this is us thinking through, okay, let's say the market price goes here, what would be our gain or loss? So let's think about what happens. Market price goes to 77. Okay, think about the stock first. We can always take this on a step-by-step -step basis. At 77, that's good for the stock. Bought stock at 60, goes up to 77. That's a $17 per share gain. We're pretty thrilled with that. But we can't forget about the option. Right? At 77, there's only one question to ask ourselves. Is the option getting exercised. Remember, call up. Okay, market price goes up above the strike price of 75. The option will be exercised. Are we there? Yes. The call will be exercised. So in this case here, at 77, really doesn't matter. It could be 77, it could be 88, it could be 5,000. Doesn't matter. That call is gonna get exercised, forcing the investor to sell their stock at 75. So we put a plus 75 on the stock row. And that's the end of the story. Feels pretty similar to maximum gain, right? We end up with a 79 on the plus side, a 60 on the minus side. We end up with a 19 left over on the plus side times 100 gets us to a $1,900 gain. Last question, gain or loss at 40? Well, I'll approach it pretty similarly to the last question. Think about the stock first. Okay, you bought stock at 60. Market price falls down to 40. Oof, not, not terribly thrilled with that. That's a $20 per share loss. Next thing we gotta figure out is what happens to the option. Will it be exercised? Call up, did the market price go up above 75? No. The call is out the money, has no intrinsic value, and at 40, we can assume it'll expire. So if this is the end of the story here, the investor is just gonna be selling their stock for 40, so we'll plug a 40 on the plus side in the stock row. Let's add up our numbers. We have a 44 on the plus side, a 60 on the minus side. That leaves us with 16 left over on the minus side times 100. That's a $1,600 loss.